it is 9am um, my time. It's almost certainly beer o'clock your time. So I will keep this nice and short. Um, thank you for joining us at the last keynote at the OWASP Global AppSec EU Virtual. Um, next year, um, the Global AppSec Virtual will no longer be a virtual. It'll be an in-person event at Dublin in February next year. So please do come along. Uh, RSVP in your calendars today. Um, we look forward to seeing you there. And I cannot I honestly cannot say how excited I am to be able to finally be able to go to Ireland. Um, so please do uh, come to the in-person event next year. Along those lines, we have a virtual global AppSec Asia Pacific. It actually has a native Japanese track as well uh, as English tracks. Um, we also have the CFP and CFT are extended at the moment. So if you want to actually present at that particular conference, please um, uh, have a look at our website and see how you can get going. In November, we're actually going to get back to in-person events. Yay! So we're looking forward to meeting everybody again at San Francisco. We will try our very hardest to make sure that as many of the keynotes and um, primary tracks will be... Um, let me just turn the sound down there. Um, will be broadcast uh, for a hybrid, but in person is way to go. Uh, we look forward to seeing everyone there. That's in early November. Lastly, we need to actually review and renew our bylaws, and to do so requires all of the members to vote. And in fact, we need 50% of you, so 3,000 out of 6,000, to vote for the new bylaws. We've never had more than 1,100 people vote before. So that's going to be excitement. Please keep an eye on your email. Uh, as the vote goes through for the bylaws, please vote. It's really important that we can replace them and we actually get your settings into the bylaws um, and we can keep them that way for many years to come. And I'm now pleased to announce Dr. Alan Shulman Pellick. She's the Managing Director of Cloud Cybersecurity in Ernst & Young in the Americas. Um, she's going to be talking to us today about cloud attack service management. Typically, cloud and infrastructure platform um, teams are separate. And with the way that the world is going, the infrastructure side of cloud implementations is infrastructure is code. So we should be bringing them together, and that's what this talk is going to be about. Dr. Alan, uh, Alex Schulman Pelig is the managing director of the Cloud Cybersecurity Consulting Services of Ernst & Young. She helps multiple clients secure their public clouds and container technologies, addressing the involved risk, cybersecurity, and regulatory requirements. In her previous role, she was the director of cloud security at Citibank. And prior to that, she was at IBM Research. Um, she holds decades of technological leadership and holds a PhD, an MSc, and BSc in computer science. She holds multiple patents and has more than 30, 30 scientific publications with thousands of citations. I can only imagine your H score. <laughs> Mine was accidental. I'm sure yours is not accidental at all. <laughs> And with that, here you go. Thank you. Take it away. Thank you, Andrew. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Good afternoon in Europe. Good morning in the US. I'm super excited to close this week of amazing OWASP talks and sessions with this wonderful topic of cloud attack surface management. And today, we'll talk about how to manage the attack vectors that we're seeing in the cloud and how they are changing our cybersecurity posture and practices and what CISOs should be doing to protect the organizations against these new attack vectors. First, let me start with the disclaimer that everything that I will be presenting is based on my 14 years of experience in cloud security and not necessarily represent the views of everyone in my organization. During the talk, we'll go through the following. First, we'll start with what are cloud attack vectors? Why cloud is different? from what we know in our traditional environments. Then we'll take several examples and we'll analyze deeper what are the attack vectors, who is responsible for them, and what are the techniques that we're seeing from the application security standpoint, uh, which means how can someone exploit these environments. Then we'll go to protection and prevention. What should we be doing? How can we mitigate these risks? What uh, organizations should be doing to provide this holistic view over this attack surface. And then 
our last topic will be the CISO view. What should CISO be doing? How can CISO reduce the risk um, across all of the environments, both from the application and cloud security standpoints? So let's start with some definitions. What is attack surface? Attack surface is defined as a set of points on the boundary of a software system, its elements, or environments where an attacker can try to enter, affect it, or extract data. In simple words, what are the entry points for an attacker to exploit our system? Then what do we mean when we're saying when analyzing the attack surface? It is actually an assessment. It's an assessment of the exploitable vulnerabilities or weaknesses that can lead to a potential system compromise. Why cloud is different? Let's look at what we had in our traditional environments. In our data centers, we had infrastructures and platforms that were provisioned by dedicated skilled system administrators. These were responsible for the provisioning of the firewalls, for the provisioning of the servers, for the provisioning of platforms like Kubernetes. And then developed, developers were operating inside this well-established perimeter, prote protecting the applications from lower level misconfigurations. They were operating safely without managing any lower level dependencies or infrastructures. For example, in our traditional environments, developers cannot impact the configuration of firewalls. But in the cloud, things are different because cloud native applications are forcing the developers to provision and manage multiple lower level dependencies. Let's maybe think why this is happening because the entire promise of cloud is to simplify the management of infrastructures and platforms. So we're getting everything transparently as a service just with one API call. But are we doing this API call right? Can we misconfigure it? So these are the new questions that developers should be asking. And even more than that, resources and platforms are deployed now as code and they're deployed over the public internet. And there is no network perimeter to protect from services misconfigurations. Now let's analyze, let's take some examples and go deeper in what we can see. Let's first look at this from the layer standpoint. And this is how we're managing this today. We're looking at layers. We have infrastructure as a service, we have platform as a service, and we have the applications, which may be containerized services or cloud native. Each layer has its own attack vectors. Let's start with the infrastructure. When provisioning the infrastructure, there are so many misconfigurations or mistakes that people can make. It starts with firewalls that are in the cloud and people may misconfigure them, but any misconfiguration of identity and access management, instance, instance metadata service, policies, permissions, anything can be exploited as an attack vector to compromise the entire system. And this is why we have cloud security posture management tools addressing exactly this layer and this type of attack vectors. Now let's look at the platform. We have platforms like Kubernetes, SQL Server, JupyterLab, and many more. Each platform, once again, may be miscon misconfigured. So people who are provisioning this should be aware of all the requirements. They should be provisioning them in a secure way. And we have dedicated tools, once again, Kubernetes posture management and other products that are helping us to prevent these misconfigurations and manage this layer of our attack surface. And then finally, we have workloads. We have containerized applications or serverless applications that operate the platform and the infrastructure. And today we address, we are looking at them as applications. So we'll do application scanning at the Java level. We are not always looking at them as they interact with the platform and the infrastructure. So what is happening today, they're being scanned for vulnerabilities, they're scanned for supply chain. 
But today I would like to focus on the interaction between all these layers because our serverless applications some are interacting with the platform and the infrastructure. They need to provision buckets. They need to provision certain uh, services that, that are needed for this application to operate. And this is what we call cloud native because in cloud native applications are using and benefiting from the wonderful services and the transparency of using them in the cloud. But the, these are also the new risks that we should be considering. So today we'll look at the interaction between the layers. And let's start with who is responsible for what. And let's look at the attack surface from the standpoint of who is responsible for this part of the attack surface, how it is being managed today, and how can we do better by combining all these roles, responsibilities, and layers. So most of you are familiar with what is called the shared responsibility model that was announced by cloud service providers. In this model, cloud service providers are responsible for the security of the cloud, while cloud users are responsible for the security in the cloud, which means cloud users are managing the attack surface from their side, from how they are using the cloud, and cloud service providers are managing their attack surface of what can happen to the infrastructures. But let's review some of the examples. Most of the cloud breaches today are starting with some type of misconfiguration, exposed credentials, open buckets, network misconfigurations, public IP addresses, improper authentication and authorization, and of course, application vulnerabilities. So obviously, users of the cloud should be managing all of this. But are they influenced by other things as well? Let's look at several examples. So first, there is the supply chain, these packages that everyone is using. Application developers are using them and cloud providers are using them. One of the most uh, unfortunately famous examples recently was the Log4j library. This is the Java library that was vulnerable and the, vul the vulnerability is called Log4j. When this became public in December, everyone became vulnerable because everyone uh, it was using this in the applications. So for the cloud users, they had to quickly patch their part, right? Where the applications are using this library, but cloud providers also had to patch this very quickly. And some of them, for example, unfortunately, applied, applied automated patches uh, that didn't go very well and actually introduced new attack vectors uh, like container exploitation and privilege escalation. So cloud users at the same time had to manage with their vulnerabilities, as well as with additional risks that cloud providers added to the mix. And so obviously cloud users need to take all of this into account when planning their protection uh, tools, environments, and layers for their cloud applications. Let me touch on an additional topic. And these are the CSP bugs and weaknesses. We don't call them vulnerabilities now because these are misconfigurations that may allow exploitation. But because these are not public libraries, we're not assigning CDEs to them. Some of the examples, even in the Capital One breach, uh, what caused it is actually a design issue <clears throat> which allowed uh, exploiting temporary credentials <clears throat> for the metadata service. The cloud provider updated this and released a new version but actually the old one was still available for backwards compatibility. <clears throat> but we are still not calling this vulnerability uh, and there is no CD number assigned. It is a, a design issue that was resolved. But still cloud users should be aware of this because there are so many organizations where developers are not reading all the blogs about breaches and they do not know that they need to update the applications to the new version. And there is no one driving for this. And our traditional vulnerability management programs are not checking for this. Let's look at some additional examples of such bugs and witnesses. <clears throat> and there are two Israeli CSPM companies that recently jointly, each of them separately, but altogether it, it boils down to eight very significant bugs and witnesses 
that were discovered in the infrastructures and platforms of the cloud providers. And, it is at, and there was an excellent co collaboration, so cloud providers are resolving all these issues, but let's just review them for us to better understand the attack surface and what should we be doing to better manage this. There are two, we can actually define two categories of these uh, newly discovered weaknesses. First of all, all of them are breaking the multi-tenant isolation, which means these companies have demonstrated that the exploitation code allowed going from their uh, account or their service to the service account or data of someone else, which means breaking the multi-tenant isolation because cloud providers should be isolating and separating between the data of the different cloud users. But then there are two types uh, of, of, of these exploitation techniques. One allows exploitation just for this specific service, which means if this is being executed on the behalf of, let's say, one user of a certain cloud service, it allows accessing the data of another user, but it is still limited to this specific service. Um, so we, we call this cross-service takeover. But there is also another type that actually allows going broader to any service of any client. So this is cross-account, cross-service takeover, uh, which, is, uh, which was shown to be possible um, through exploitation of witnesses in deployment mechanisms or, or similar in nature, uh, because this is what allows to go broader. So once again, these are not uh, uh, real attacks. Uh, these are just researchers finding these weaknesses, reporting and resolving them. But what we are learning from this exercise in a way that multi-tenant isolation can be broken. This, this is why we need to have several layers of defense uh, so that if something bad happens, we can still manage with the situation. And we also need to start treating these design issues and weaknesses as vulnerabilities because we need to ensure that our application developers are aware of them and they're improving their code and they're addressing them and they're always using the most recent design, the most recent version, uh, and they're updating everything that the application needs to actually consume the solution, the resolution of these weaknesses as soon as possible. From the application security standpoint, let's look at the exploitation techniques. <clears throat> Overall, this is very similar to, to what is typically published by OWASP. Um, the most probably the most common technique is server-side request forgery, where an attacker can make arbitrary web requests from a compromised server to some other targets. And this is what allows actually cross-account, cross-service exploitation. Um, then extraction from environment variables, third party exploitation as well, because it was shown that actually uh, there are many companies that are unknowing, uh, they're just not aware of this. And when they're consuming SaaS services, SaaS services are requesting certain access to cloud environments, and they're just granting this access. So the, these overprivileged SaaS services is, an, is another attack vector that we've seen. Um, but we're putting this in the category of credentials because these are overprivileged roles or tokens or exposed credentials that may be used to attack the environment. Uh, then another uh, technique is uh, cloud deployment code exploitation, both uh, injection of code, for example, through uh, weak access controls on repositories of buckets, objects actually storing the code itself, where an attacker can update the code and inject uh, malicious pieces. Other techniques as uh, XML external entity. Uh, this is, these are the techniques that we've seen both in breaches and research projects showing and demonstrating uh, various attack scenarios. Uh, and then obviously there are SQL injections that can be done also via functions. And no SQL injections, uh, because no SQL databases may still be exploited uh, via techniques that are very similar in nature 
to SQL injection techniques, but essentially getting the data through these queries um, and remote account, uh, access takeover is also something that we've seen repeating throughout these dem demonstrations of attack vectors or um, the breaches that were published and we could analyze the data. So now let me summarize what we've seen. First, we saw that cloud can be exploited by application exploitation techniques. Then we also know that cloud management code is accessible via internet and exposed to application exploitation techniques. So in a way, the situation is we have more risk than we had, we had before because the same application exploitation techniques can now be applied to infrastructure as code and it is over the internet. So overall, the risks in some cases are higher. And then we're coming to this conclusion that application security processes and approaches should be applied to cloud code and environments. And this is what we'll be talking about today. So let's move to the next topic. What should we be doing to protect our environments, to prevent all of this from happening? Uh, because obviously new attack vectors will be occurring all the time. And let me also maybe pause to explain that we need to accept this. Uh, this is the nature of our modern environments. We do need cloud, cloud is not a question, it's the reality of our modern applications. It, we need this to deliver business value. Uh, companies need this to build their businesses. So it's not a matter of choice, Th that's the reality. We have the cloud, we have these attack vectors, and we need to, to establish processes for the holistic management and prevention of various attack vectors. So first of all, Defense in depth. <laughs> Most probably all of you heard this so many times. Still, it is not always happening. So let's review this on the example of Log for Shell, which was announced in December. And suddenly everyone became vulnerable. So all the applications are vulnerable. The cloud provider itself is vulnerable. So everyone can be exploited uh, through just one issue in a library that everyone is using. So many organizations were able to quickly manage with this issue through things like WAF. So even before they managed to patch all the environments, WAF was their first solution. Let's just block this. Let's, let's prevent this from being exploited through web application firewalls. And, and, and many of the providers were very quick with supporting this. And many organizations were very, very happy. Okay, at least. We, we have this additional layer protecting us, and now we can remediate uh, the log for shell vulnerability. But still, as you saw, even some of the issues, uh, for example, the cloud provider that did the right thing, automated the patching, but suddenly became vulnerable, uh, allowing, because of the mistake, allowing um, a bigger option of privilege escalation then we need to present, prevent this as well. We need to be ready for this. What's the solution? We need to have both path and segmentation so that if there are some, there are some issues, for example, exploitation through uh, breaking the multi-tenancy of the cloud provider, this cross-account, cross-service um, attack vector that I have described, if we have segmentation, it will prevent the attacker from propagating further it will scope and reduce the blast radius of what may happen. So that's another way to mitigate, reduce the risk and, and handle the situation. Then additional tools, host-based intrusion prevention uh, and other uh, solutions like runtime application self-protection that can add additional layer of protection. And there are always new, new and emerging technologies adding more and more layers and it is important to emphasize, yes, it is important to have layers of defense. We cannot rely just on one tool, just on one provider, and it is this layered approach that will help us to manage with what we discussed before. But then there is also cloud native, because look at the cloud native uh, system as ecosystem in itself, where applications are using multiple services, uh, as mentioned, containerized serverless, so this 
this mix of application and underlying platform uh, and services from the cloud provider. And we need to properly manage and control this. So these are the three points that we've seen as the most critical ones to actually reduce the risk. First, use policies, code, and have processes to harden all these environments, put guardrails and patterns, helping the application developers to be more secure. Don't rely on just on application developers. Give them these patterns and give these guardrails that will protect them from making mistakes and misconfigurations. And still be ready to respond. The cyber response piece is very critical. What happens if, if a certain uh, weakness, bug, or vulnerability is being exploited? How should we respond to this? So now let's go deeper into all of these aspects uh, and we'll see some examples. But first, let me also define how we should be looking at this. Let's, let, let's think, think of ourselves as CISOs. As a CISO, uh, we cannot just think about one weakness or one bug is this major problem because we need to cover everything. It is the coverage, it is the holistic view and the metrics that will give us some indication of, of are we going to do good? Are we doing bad? Can we improve? Can we improve our time? And this is the goal of CISO programs. Traditionally, we had cloud security program and application security program uh, working together, and they may remain separate or maybe combined, but let's review the roles of both. So what application security programs typically doing in, in large organizations? First, ensuring that there are th these gates to scan the applications, um, static code analysis, dynamic code analysis, all, all the application security best practices, developer training of, uh, and awareness. They're also initiating threat modeling for the most critical applications, pen testing, and uh, running these programs for the detection and resolution of vulnerabilities. And of course, adding DevSecOps practices for the application itself, adding all the application security tools to the DevOps processes. Now let's look at the cloud security programs and what are they doing today? And in a way they are augmenting application security programs. They're very similar in nature typically, <clears throat> but instead of, for example, scanning the Java application, they're scanning infrastructure as code that, that is managing the cloud environments. They're initiating threat modeling exercises, both on the cloud service provider services and applications uh, that are using these services in the cloud, focusing on cloud native uh, attack scenarios uh, and attack vectors that we've been reviewing today, initiating pen testing and monitoring for misconfigurations and then driving for resolution. And of course, doing this developer training, but cloud native developer training is slightly different from traditional developer training so cloud security programs today are building exactly this. What should developers know in addition to what they know today? They need to learn how to securely operate cloud. When the application is using the underlying cloud platform, platforms and services, what are the risks and what should application developers be aware of? So all of these are on the agenda of cloud security programs. And these programs may remain separate or maybe combined, but there is a need to cover for all of these aspects. Let, let's review this. This graph actually shows the life cycle of such a program. <clears throat> and let me explain this on the example of a cloud security program. Uh, typically, many CISOs are initiating this. Please come and check how we're we doing. What is our cloud security posture? What is the amount of misconfigurations, vulnerabilities that we have in the cloud and help us to analyze our attack vectors? So when we're coming to, to do these assessments, typically uh, we're expanding uh, the visibility, bringing more tools or adding more policies to get visibility into the environments. And then typically we'll see more. So you will see this, what you can see in this graph is uh, uh, the y-axis, uh, these are the findings. So typically, if we initiate um, additional search, uh, additional tools for visibility, mapping of, of misconfigurations, we'll see more. But the secret is actually how to resolve them and how 
to keep everything green and secure over time. Let me give you some examples. Uh, in almost every case, we can see that, for example, instances are not properly encrypted. That's a very common mistake of <clears throat> application developers. Obviously, the solution is not to go back and change this manually for thousands of instances. The solution is go back and remediate the deployment code. And this is the way to get to the screen state, actually resolving the issues, analyzing what's the root cause, and then going back to the code, typically it's about one or two lines of code that if resolved will impact the entire environment. But it is critical to do two things. <clears throat> one, this root cause analysis, and second, addressing all types of findings. As I mentioned, we cannot look just as at vulnerabilities with this assigned CV number and risk because there are just so many misconfigurations, there are bugs and weaknesses, and they're also opening our environments and they're also putting us at risk. So this is why these three things of CVEs, misconfigurations and then bugs and weaknesses are so critical. <coughs> Sorry, what should we be doing with this? What I've seen it is this combination of visibility and addressing the root cause. And there is this balance because we can't do just one of them. We need to do both and we need to do both in parallel. Getting visibility, seeing all these red items, getting to the root cause and updating the code, resolving them through these preventative controls and preventative guardrails. And this is how we're resolving this over time. What are the metrics for success? So let me give just a few metrics. Of course, the, the amount of metrics that we should be measuring is much higher, but this is just for our remediation efforts. First, visibility and scanning coverage. When, when, when this graph of findings that we got red items, are we looking at everything we should be looking at, or maybe there are additional environments that we are not looking at? Then pro, prioritization of high risk items, because everything may be red. There are just maybe too many issues and we cannot resolve everything at once. <clears throat> so we need to prioritize and we need to detect these most critical items that should be resolved first. And there, is, there are actually two things, two attributes that, uh, that are useful to look at. First, the criticality of the item and then also the impact. For example, if there is this one line uh, with unencrypted volumes and all the instances are deployed from this code, not encrypting the volumes, if we'll fix this line, all the volumes will be encrypted. So by fixing one line, we impacted thousands of instances. And that's a good high priority item to start with uh, because it is easy to fix. The impact is big. The risk of, of exposing the data is high. <clears throat> then additional metric is also around life cycle and gates. Are we scanning through the entire life cycle? Or are we looking just pre-deployment or just runtime? <clears throat> Typically it's not enough just to look at one of them. Because if we're scanning just at runtime, it's, it may be too late. If, <clears throat> if we're scanning just pre-deployment, then still if there isn't an, an attack or exploitation after the code is deployed, will completely miss it. So measuring the scanning gates and lifecycle management is very critical. And then the last <clears throat> phases are actually how we're responding. It, because typically the amount of issues is bigger than we can resolve manually. So having systems for tagging and auto-ticketing, <clears throat> assigning the priority and then resolving the issues this is very critical. And without this, it is almost impossible to remediate these findings. <clears throat> and, final, and finally, once we're fixing the issues, what is the speed of redeployment? <clears throat> let's back to our example of unencrypted volumes. It, let's assume we detected the problem, we fix this one line of code. <clears throat> if the instances are not redeployed, we didn't really resolve it. So measuring the speed of redeployment and mean time to resolve for each and every issue is very critical. And, and this is an important metric for the success of these programs. 
<clears throat> and let me maybe finish this with one additional example of where cloud is different and, and where are we talking about cloud security combined with application security. <clears throat> it is about uh, the management of the life cycle of public cloud services. If we're looking at this, every service may be misconfigured. Most of these services are defined as multi-tenant by nature, which means let's take object storage as an example. It is one service for all the clients. It is not deployed in this dedicated way just for each account. It is shared between everyone. <clears throat> so if someone is misconfiguring it, then no network can, can protect against this. It is just <clears throat> policy misconfiguration and the bucket is exposed. <clears throat> so this management of the life cycle, how we are doing the services and what's the life cycle, how to secure the foundations, how to secure the build of the application creating this bucket, <clears throat> then the runtime, and then how can we improve over time. So this, uh, what many organizations are doing today, they are defining these uh, baselines for each and every service that they're using in public clouds, creating these rules, for example, uh, for instances, the volumes should be encrypted in this way, uh, for storage buckets, these are the policies, these are the default policies inside our organization. <clears throat> and this is the deployment code that should be used. And then there are monitoring tools to detect if something is misconfigured <clears throat> to generate events and then handle them and do the, the remediation that we've been discussing. <clears throat> but we need to do this for each and every service. And this pipeline is actually very similar to our traditional AppSec pipeline. <clears throat> Sorry, because it should start with threat analysis, exactly as an application security. What are the attack scenarios? Then how the service should be configured to prevent this? Then what are the guidelines for developers? What is the deployment code? How are we monitoring this? And what are we doing if something goes wrong? It, many organizations are going in this direction, but it may emphasize maybe one of the most critical points of how to do it right. It is the policy as code piece that is very critical. A policy as code has many meanings. Essentially, it's policy written as code, and it may, may be implemented at various stages. In this scenario, <clears throat> these are the compliance rules that before we're deploying a certain service, we can scan. Is it according to what we define? And if not, we'll not allow the deployment. The same at runtime, we can have policy as code monitoring. And if something is not aligned with, with this baseline definition, there will be an alert <clears throat> and remediation procedures. <clears throat> so let me finish with highlighting what, how this policy as code is helping us and what's the meaning of it. And all of you are familiar with the concept of DevSecOps. It's the essential integration of security tools into our DevOps processes through the entire uh, life cycle of our applications. <clears throat> Policy as code is actually a mechanism to make our DevSecOps processes better by defining the rules, by defining these gates and saying, this is the policy. This is the, the gate as part of our DevSecOps process, but it is the, the policy as code that defines, these are the rules of the road. If you're not following them, you will not pass to the next stage. And this is why DevSecOps and policy as code are actually complementing each other and we need both. <clears throat> so let me summarize with what we've seen today. We saw that cloud can be exploited by application exploitation techniques. So cloud security and application security are coming together. Cloud management code is accessible via internet, exposed uh, uh, to potentially malicious attackers that can use traditional application exploitation techniques. That, therefore, application security processes should be integrated with cloud security programs to check for all of these issues. And then finally, from the CISO standpoint, cloud and application security programs are essential. They should cover attack surface management, DevSecOps, and policies. And with this, uh, thank you for listening, and I'll pass it to questions. 
Thank you so much. And uh, I'll give you a couple of ticks there to get, um, you know, a little drink going. Um, okay, we do have a number of questions. So the uh, Dorothy Dixer, which is what we call a question that we've asked ourselves, um, there's actually four of them that aren't, that come from the audience. So the first question with four votes is, what are the recommended tools for CSP threat modeling? Yeah. I wish I could give you a name of a product. Unfortunately, this space is emerging. Most of the threat modeling methodologies were developed a, a very application security centric. I think this space is still evolving. Indeed, many organizations need to do this manually still. Okay. And I, I, I hope that soon I will be able to recommend the product. Unfortunately, I think we're still <clears throat> not at this winning phase right now. But so would that... love to continue for, if any of you will hear about these technologies, please share with the rest of the group today. Yeah, I mean, we're an open source organization. If there's a um, person in the audience who wants to get going on such a tool, we actually do have a tool called Threat Dragon. Um, we also have tools called um, the, um, the folks who do Iris Risk um, through Stephen DeVries and others. Uh, you may want to just have a look at those and see if we can extend them to include CSP threat modeling. Um, obviously, a Microsoft threat modeling tool exists as well, but if you are interested in doing this work, um, it doesn't have to be a commercial tool. And I think realistically, our goal is to help developers all over the world. So if this is, this question had the most number of votes, so there was obviously an interest. Uh, if you are interested, please do contact Harold Blankenship, who is uh, the Pro Technology and Projects Director, and let's see if we can get some improvements going. Okay. Yes, thank you. We would love to continue to be part of this forum and uh, indeed there are many improvements that we have solid foundations in threat modeling. So it's about taking this to the next level and an uh, excellent question and definitely a great initiative to push forward. Absolutely. Okay, so the next most popular question is due to limited knowledge of cloud security, how to make sure developer or SB, I'm not too sure what SB is, but who manages um, the, who managed to do the right configuration? So um, I'm not too sure what they mean by SB, but um, I'm not sure. But anyway, um, how do we make sure that the right person has actually done the right configuration? Who manages it? Yes, so maybe just guessing service, maybe SP is service provider. Ah. And parts of this, because indeed, if we're talking about our application, applications, let's say I have, I have developed an application, I'm putting this into the cloud, I would use CSPM or other tools to actually check for misconfigurations and other things. But sometimes there are service providers and third parties that, uh, that they're responsible for actually implementing this. And, and, and indeed, this is actually a, an excellent question and many many organizations are really worried about this because they're consuming software as SaaS. But actually it's just another company another service provider building these applications over public cloud services and a, many clients of these service providers they want to know that this application is secure and not exposed exposed to the attack vectors that we've been discussing um, so what is emerging right now still is a discussion. I still didn't see this fully forced, but this is something to discuss as part of the agreements with the mm -hmm. service providers for them to bring these attestations. So, some of the attestations are provided as part of soft tool processes or others, but they will not go very deep into these emerging attack scenarios and how to check them. Uh, so discuss one option is to discuss this as part of the agreements with the service providers that will be that they will be providing these more advanced attestations from more advanced tools or agreeing to periodic audit processes so that the client will actually ask to periodically audit the service provider and check for these issues so these are the solutions that i've seen in this space in this space hopefully this answered the question if not then <laughs> Please add additional details and they will address. Sure. 
Okay, so the next question is, are you aware of any regulation or compliance um, uh, standard that prevents using cloud and multi-tenant setup and requires a customer to have a dedicated hardware? And the example they give is PCI DSS, which I'm reasonably certain doesn't prevent that. But are you aware of any other standards or compliance requirements that require dedicated hardware? I think uh, honestly I'm not a lawyer I think there may be cases where this may be required for some specific use cases and uh, um, some defense related scenarios or things like, like that um, it is of course it will be more secure <laughs> but I think uh, also today um, in many discussions about compliance people understand that if they will be too strict in these requirements, they will be preventing innovation for many companies. Mm. So this is why there is this uh, uh, gentle balance, right? Can we actually say no to the cloud? Can we force people to say no to the cloud? Because in many cases, they don't have a choice. There are so many solutions that are available today only over cloud environments, mm. even if we're thinking about blockchain or other applications, many of them are available only over the cloud. So organizations that need to integrate this, they're actually forced to go into the cloud. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but this question, I think it will apply. Certain organizations, yes, may have these uh, additional requirements based on, on their use cases. But, but these, uh, these situations, I think, are just uh, handled separately. And, and many organizations, Honestly, I'm still very concerned to go to public, uh, to public clouds. So many organizations are still having data centers, not necessarily because um, regulators are saying you cannot do this, but they're concerned that if they will go, maybe they will not fully satisfy their part of the shared responsibility or the cloud, uh, the multi-tenant isolation may be broken and then they, they will expose actually their clients so there are organizations that are still concerned with this. Yeah, I mean, honestly, a lot of this stuff comes back to the people who believe that data has a special place um, on this planet instead of just an IP address. Um, ever since the 1960s and 1970s where IBM were running LPARs for various clients and that is the underpinning of the world financial system. This is a ridiculous question but there are some ridiculous compliance requirements out there. So there are plenty of firms making a lot of money from people implementing these ridiculous requirements. It really should be about whether or not it's secure or not, not where it's located or who, whose other computer it's on. Um, I think if most banks were required to host their own mainframes, um, particularly for BCP or DR purposes, they would fail this compliance check and therefore it's a ridiculous compliance. Um, I'm extraordinarily unimpressed with anybody who thinks along those lines because it's not about security, it's about job security or making sure that someone gets paid um, rather than uptime or security or some other non-performance, sorry, non-functional non requirement. Um, I feel very passionately about this and um, to me, I'd, I'd take tangible security over pretend hand wavy security, Visio security every day of the week. Um, just because there's a dashed line somewhere that says this is our private virtual network, hackers don't care, they really don't. <laughs> anyway. Let's just move on. I, as you can tell, I'm, pr I'm very biased against the actual question. Um, and um, just for the record, I also am not aware of any regulations that do that. I'm sure there are some. Um, this is the Dorothy Dixert. Have you got any examples of firms or organizations that have actually done this convergence? And what were the challenges or successes that, you know, that they had? Yes, thank you. So uh, maybe I'll just share from my personal experience because uh, as part of my role at Citibank, uh, I, uh, I built the CISO Cloud Security Program, but the one, it was built in this close collaboration with the Application Security Program, because we already saw these interaction points and the need to actually combine our approaches and, um, and have this as one holistic view, scanning application, then scanning containers, then scanning 
infrastructure as code, for example. So uh, we started this at Citibank. Now is Ernest and Young. It, we started with two practices, cloud security practice and application security practice. And just through our projects to clients, we saw that uh, most of our projects are combining both. And we need people who are skilled in both, who both know application security and know cloud security, are familiar with all these attack vectors and how to prevent them. So internally, we merged uh, our practices. We have, uh, we call it attack surface management now. And we have a team of trained professionals looking at cloud and application security uh, in this holistic way. So uh, we have actually implemented this and this is the, the mission of our team. Cool. Um, the next question is, do you know of any blogs? Um, oh, actually, it just switched over. Um, I'll, I'll ask someone I was originally going to ask. Do you know of any standard that is planning to define policy as code? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, I think uh, OPA is becoming very popular as an approach to policies code management as this architecture where policy decision point is separated. So I think we're converging not as a standard, not as a compliance standard, but as an architectural standard um, and architectural concept. But the mechanisms to do policy as code is very different. And we have, and we'll continue to have many ways we're actually doing policy as code, and we should continue doing this. Let me give you some example, examples. What we mentioned for the deployment of public cloud services, we can have pre-deployment policy as code checking that what we are deploying uh, aligns with our rules. For example, checking that there are no open buckets uh, and all the volumes are encrypted. Uh, uh, through our pre-deployment code. Uh, this can be done as policy as code. Another example of policy as code is defined as part of CSPM tools, right? So we want to align and have exactly the same rules now, monitoring and alerting if things are violated. But we also have, for example, policy as code, even as part of network management or network segmentation tools. Even the rules, how are we doing network segmentation? These are also policies and we should have them as policies code. So right now the situation is that, and we have actually many also ways to do policies code. It may be policy in the platform, policy in the product, policy, organizational policy that we're now extracting to offer. Uh, so today we have many, many policies code initiatives. We should continue progressing with all of them. We should not be stopping this automation effort because uh, there may be better ways to consolidate but there is a need to have the holistic view on these places of policy as code, just to ensure that we're defining the same rules across all of our environments and places. So maybe bottom line, policy as code may continue to be distributed, although we do want to centralize it. So we need to accept that in spite uh, our open inspired architectures, <clears throat> we'll still have some distribution of policy as code so we need to continue both trying to centralize and then still have this view on all of the decentralized instances and still continue to automate. So the most critical thing is not to stop the process, automate and transition from policies that are written on paper to policies written as code and can be aggregated and reviewed uh, in this automated way. Hopefully this answered the question. <laughs> I think it did. Thank you. The last question we've got, and then we'll wrap it up, is are there any tools or blogs we can follow to find these CSP bugs or configs? Um, obviously, you might want to put a URL or two in. Is Do you have social media, like a Twitter handle, that they could actually go look at and you can paste there? Yes. So so first, personally, I'm very careful. Um, we we'll always need, and, and the cloud provider, cloud, CSPM, typically these are published by CSPM companies, so you can follow the blogs of CSPM companies. Typically they're publishing because they understand the responsibility they're publishing this only once things, things are resolved. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at cloud native forums, for example, there is a community cl called CloudSec uh, through which you can see some of these publications um, and also just reading the blogs of, of cloud security companies. Uh, and the most critical thing is actually not just 
to read and say, wow, that's a problem. Hopefully in most cases, the cloud providers will continue quickly resolving these issues so that clients uh, are not impacted by this. And uh, uh, once these are reported or discovered, they're doing whatever they can to quickly resolve the issues. But what is critical actually for us to keep in mind that it is possible and we need to accept this and we need to design our architectures in a way that they will be able to manage with this. And we need to design our cybersecurity processes to be able to quickly scope the event and respond to it. Okay, um, there is actually one more question that just snuck in. Um, are there any recommended tool or services for asset management? Oh, that, that's an excellent point. <laughs> because what we've seen, there are sometimes excellent tools, but they will be just for one cloud provider. Because you need to speak the cloud native language to actually get all of the assets. So there are certain open source event tools for cloud native asset management, but they will not always cover all the environments. So what we've seen organizations today, sometimes they will use, one, let's say, one open source tool in one environment, but then they need to implement something similar by themselves in other cloud environments. <clears throat> and in a way, this is also on the agenda of CISO cloud security programs to check that there are processes doing this asset management, actually even just reading the APIs from the cloud provider, doing this kind of uh, by themselves, uh, doing all these API calls, uh, mapping what are the resources that they have and keeping this as a registry on-prem uh, because in case of the incident, it is very critical to know what was impacted, what is the scope of the event, and without these tools, it is very difficult to manage. So excellent question. I hope this space will continue emerging. And once again, maybe um, as part of the OWASP organization, mm -hmm. uh, there will be initial, additional initiatives to help with asset management in the cloud. No excellent worries. question so far. You, 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 you're raising exactly the, the, the most critical topics where we need additional investment in the industry and we need more tools and more holistic solutions. So both threat modeling and asset management uh, are excellent topics. And, uh, and maybe uh, as part of OWASP, uh, we can invest more in this. And with that, we are at time. Thank you so much for a great talk. And I think we had a lot of questions which sort of demonstrate the, the relevance and the interest that people have in this particular topic. And so we do hope to see you again at a future conference. Thank you so much for being a keynote at ours. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, everyone, for joining. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for your wonderful questions, and thank you for listening. No worries. Thank you.